really glad to welcome Dr. Thomas Boothby to campus. Um, had a good time chatting with him today about, about his work. Um, uh, he's had an a interesting um, uh, life story in terms of uh, living in some different places. Uh, I love to travel, so it's been fun to hear about some of the places he's been. He grew up uh, in several different countries, uh, Mozambique, Kenya, and, and Switzerland, and then uh, has been in the U.S. for his uh, tertiary, so uh, college level education, right? So he did his undergraduate work at Tulane, his uh, PhD training at University of Maryland, uh, looking at drought tolerance in ferns. And uh, that was interesting to hear about too. I'm not a plant biologist, so it's, it's new to me, but it was really interesting to hear that. Um, Postgrad or postdoc work at North Carolina, and now he's uh, a new faculty <coughs> member at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. So he's moving closer to us on the in the Mountain West a little bit. And uh, one of the places he's been that I'd really like to go is Antarctica, and that sounds like a really fun place to visit, also. So um, uh, I don't want to take up any more of his time. So let's welcome Dr. Boothby. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. And uh, I'll just start off by saying that I remember being a student and listening to some seminars and them just being kind of out of my wheelhouse. So if I'm talking about anything that you haven't covered in any of your classes or you feel like you're getting lost, feel free to chime in and ask a question. You don't have to hold the question until the end. Um, but yeah, so um, as Dr. Daniel said, uh, my name's Thomas. Um, and what my lab studies and what I'm really interested in is trying to understand how organisms are able to survive in environments that we typically think of as being restricted to life. So experiencing stresses in environments that are so harsh that even purified biological molecules like DNA and proteins and membranes can't tolerate those conditions. Um, and what I'm going to tell you about today is I'm going to start off giving you an introduction to the organism that we use in my lab called a tardigrade. Um, then I'm going to tell you about some proteins that these tardigrades make called cytosolic abundant heat soluble or CAHS proteins for short. Uh, and how um, the experiments that we've done and the evidence that we've gathered to show that these are functional mediators of desiccation tolerance. So they allow the animal to survive drying out. And then in the last part of my talk, I'll get into some of the mechanistic work we've done, looking at how we think these proteins actually work in the animals to help protect them when they dry out. Uh, and that's through the formation of gels and ultimately glasses when they, when they fully dry out. And that'll hopefully become a little bit more clear as we get into the talk, what I mean by that. So to start off, Maybe you saw this word on the title of my slide and had no idea what I was talking about, but a tardigrade or a water bear, as they're commonly called, are these little tiny microscopic animals. Um, they're so small that you need a microscope to see them. But if you look at them under a microscope, what you'll see is these little creatures that kind of resemble chubby little eight-legged gummy bears. Um, and uh, so, yeah, this, this is what they look like. Um, they're an ancient group, so they evolved at least 250 million years ago during the Cambrian period. As I mentioned before, they're small, so different species range in size from about 50 microns up to a millimeter. Um, they're a diverse group of animals, so we know of at least 1,200 species that are alive today. And honestly, that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. Whenever we go out looking for species that we know of, we usually find new ones. Um, and then evolutionarily, tardigrades, uh, they make up a phylum unto themselves, so a group of animals unto themselves, the phylum tardigrata. But this, this phylum is placed within a larger group of animals that you may, have, uh, may be more familiar with um, called ecdysozoa. And ecdysozoa contains some better known animals like arthropods, so like the fruit fly, Drosophila, is, a, is an arthropod. Or uh, nematode worms, like C. elegans. So for comparative studies, tardigrades are really, really great. Because um, you know, evolutionarily, they're sort of sandwiched between these two really well-developed genetic and vertebrate developmental systems. Now, you may have never seen a tardigrade before. 
That's not because they're rare. You can actually find them everywhere. They've been found on every continent, including Antarctica. Uh, and they live in almost any sort of uh, biome. So tardigrades live in hot, dry places like deserts, cold places like the tundra or Antarctica. Um, they're marine species. Um, there are species that have been found in the forest, uh, in places with lots of geothermal activity, um, on the tops of mountains. But you can even just go in your backyard, and if you have a microscope, uh, you can find them in your backyard. They're living back there. So what's probably given tardigrades the ability to colonize all these diverse ecosystems is the fact that they are extreme survivors. So tardigrades can survive a number of environmental extremes that we typically think of as being incompatible with life. So I already mentioned that tardigrades can survive desiccation or drying out. Um, and what that means is basically they can lose all the water inside their bodies and cells and yet remain viable. They can stay alive. And when they do that, they go from looking like these little chubby eight-legged gummy bear things to pulling in their eight legs and head inside their cuticle or exoskeleton. And they curl up and form this little ball-like structure called a ton, T-U-N. And that comes from the German for uh, a barrel or a cask. So they kind of like curl up in this little barrel-like shape. And in this dry little ton state, they become ametabolic, so all their life processes basically shut down, and they can remain like that in this ametabolic state for years, and in some cases, decades. But if you put them back in water, within an hour or so, they'll be running around in their dish, eating, reproducing, like nothing happened to them. So that's really amazing, I think. Um, but what I think is even more amazing is that Tardigrades don't just survive desiccation, but they can survive a number of other extremes. Um, so tardigrades are known to survive extremes in temperature, so they can survive being frozen. These are kind of like the world records for tardigrades. So there's been a species that's been frozen down to two, negative 272 degrees C. That's about a degree above absolute zero, the temperature at which all molecular motion stops. So it's... Uh, a degree away from as cold as you can be. Um, other, other species have been shown to survive temperatures well above the boiling point of water. Um, there are species that can survive massive amounts of radiation, so thousands of times as much uh, exposure to radiation as we could survive. Tardigrades can go for days or weeks with little or no oxygen. They're actually the only animal that we know of that can survive prolonged exposure to the vacuum of outer space. So back in 2010, there was a European Space Agency mission where they used this Russian capsule. And this capsule orbited the Earth in low Earth orbit for 10 days. And there were tardigrades stuck outside of the capsule. And so they were exposed to the vacuum and solar radiation of outer space for 10 days. When they recovered the samples, they found that most of the adults survived. Those adults could give birth to offspring. The offspring were fine. They could have offspring. And to this day, there's a lab in Sweden that's still propagating the progeny of these space-flown animals. So despite being some of the smallest animals that we know of, tardigrades are extremely hardy and robust. And the question that my lab essentially tries to answer is the question of how. How are these animals able to survive all these different stresses? Um, and for me, what that means is identifying the molecules that mediate these stress tolerances. So like what, what are the things inside tardigrade cells that allow them to do this? And then understanding the mechanisms by which those mediators work. So, so how do those molecules actually function to help protect the animals? And today what I'm going to tell you about is some of the research that we've done looking into how these organisms survive desiccation or drying out. So when I started working with tardigrades, at the molecular level, essentially nothing was known about how they survive any, any stress, let alone desiccation. Essentially, this was the state of the art back then. This was, this was like our accumulated knowledge on how tardigrades survive drying. 
And basically, what this graph is showing is survival on the y-axis and then relative humidity on the x-axis. And so the, ex the, the experiment is controlling relative humidity to basically control how fast the animals can dry out. So the more humid the chamber that they're in is, the more slowly they'll dry out. The less humid, the more quickly they'll dry out. And what you can see is there's three different species on here. And at high humidity, so when they dry out slowly, you have a lot of survival. But as you decrease the humidity, so the animals are drying out more quickly, they don't survive very well. And at a certain point, you just get no survival at all, right? So essentially what we knew was you can dry tardigrades out, but if you do it too quickly, they won't survive. If you do it slowly enough, they will survive. And just to sort of, sort of illustrate this, if you slow dry these animals, they form this, this ton. If you dry them out quickly, they don't, and they just kind of crumple up and look like little like potato chips under the microscope. So the hypothesis that this led me to, to formulate was that tardigrades may have to dry out slowly because they need time to make and accumulate a protectant or protectants that are going to basically safeguard them when they dry out. Um, and so to try and test that, we did basically the sort of most simple comparative transcriptomics experiment that you can do, where we started off with one large culture of animals. We split it evenly six ways. Then half of those uh, subcultures we left hydrated, so those weren't stressed out at all. The other three we dried out, so they experienced the stress of like going through desiccation. Then we extracted RNA from all these samples and we sequenced the RNA. And what you can do is with those RNA sequences is you can map them back onto a genome sequence and basically see the relative expression level of genes in the genome. So like how active different genes are under hydrated and drying conditions. So in that way, we're able to basically see which genes are changing their expression as the animals are drying out. Now, when you do this, you can make what's called an MA plot. Um, so this is an MA plot that we're showing here. And this might look complicated, but it's actually, it's not too bad. So each one of these dots represents a gene in the tardigrade genome, all right? And on the y-axis, we have plotted enrichment. So like, is that gene being activated during drying or repressed during drying? So if the gene is becoming more active during drying, the dot is going to be plotted lower on the y-axis. So like all these genes are expressed more during drying than under hydrated conditions. And on the, on the x-axis, we have plotted the overall abundance of transcript that's coming from that gene. So if a gene's really active and making a lot of transcripts, it's going to be plotted further to the right on the x-axis. So in this area of the graph here are where genes that are enriched during drying, so they get expressed more when the animals are drying out, and are expressed at really high levels are going to be plotted. And, and the, those are the genes that we were most interested in seeing uh, what they were. So when we saw what genes fall out in that area of the graph, we started getting really excited because there was a whole group of genes that all belong to the same gene family that fell into that part of the graph. So there's 11 genes that are highlighted in red here that are, that are boxed in this area. And those genes belong to this family of genes that encode what are called cytosolic abundant heat soluble proteins. Now that's like a mouthful for me to keep saying for the rest of the talk. So I'm just gonna call them CAHS genes for short, all right? So CHS genes, just to, just to recap, they're enriched. So they basically get turned on to higher levels when the animals are drying out. And those genes make a ton of transcript, all right? Now, another thing that's really interesting about these genes is if you compare their sequence or the sequence of the proteins that they encode to every other sequence from every other organism that we know of, they don't match anything. So... There's a lot of like bioinformatic approaches you can do to compare gene and protein sequences. And I don't know if you can see this in the audience, but basically here's the results from all these different searches that we did. 
And basically, they all, all these red boxes are highlighting uh, the fact that those predictive tools basically come back and say, sorry, your sequences match nothing else out there. So these genes and the proteins that they encode appear to be, at the level of sequence conservation, unique to tardigrades. So only tardigrades have these genes. Another thing that's really interesting about these genes is the proteins that they encode. So the proteins that these genes encode are what we call intrinsically disordered proteins. So what that means is, it means that these proteins don't have a stable 3D shape, all right, a stable conformation. Now, if any of you have taken protein biochemistry, you might be scratching your head because, you know, in, in intro biochemistry, you learn that the structure of a protein or an enzyme is essential for its function, right? If you unfold a protein or begin to denature it, it essentially breaks. So intrinsically disordered proteins are really interesting because they can sort of constantly change their shape or structure in solution, and yet they can still perform important cellular functions, even though they don't have a stable conformation. Now this was really exciting for us to see because for a long time in the desiccation tolerance field, it, IDPs, or intrinsically disordered proteins, have been implicated in other organisms in mediating stress tolerance. So it's really exciting for us to see that tardigrades have unique proteins that are intrinsically disordered and are upregulated and made at really massive levels during desiccation. Um, but all that is sort of, uh, th those are all just sort of hints and clues that these might be good candidates to follow up on. Um, so we wanted to actually do some functional experiments and see if we basically mess up the ability of tardigrades to make these proteins, can they still survive desiccation? So in tardigrades, we can use a technique called RNA interference, which some of you may have not encountered that yet in your courses, but basically you can target specific RNAs for destruction. So if, if there's a gene that you want to basically like turn down the levels of its expression, you can use RNA interference to destroy the transcripts that are coming from it. So we do that by making these little tiny glass needles and loading them with our RNA interference um, cocktail that we then inject directly into the animals using a microinjector. So here on this graph, what I'm showing you is survival of the animals. Um, in green is a GFP control. So in, in that case, we're targeting GFP for destruction, green fluorescent protein. But these animals don't make GFP, so it's just kind of like a mock injection to make sure we're not just killing them because we're injecting them. Uh, then we targeted four different CHS genes. And in this experiment, um, we did the RNA interference, but we didn't dry the animals out. We left them hydrated. So we wanted to see if they needed these genes to be functional just to survive under normal non-stress conditions. And as you can see, under normal non-stress conditions, all the animals sort of pretty much survived, right? There wasn't any big decrease in survival. However, if we do the same experiment where we inject the animals with the RNA interference cocktail and then we dry them out and rehydrate them and score survival to see, see uh, what proportion of the animals survive, what you can see is in our, in our mock injection, we get about 80% of the animals surviving. But in some of our uh, experiments where we targeted the CHS genes, we got severely uh, decreased levels of survival. So, you know, in the most severe cases, we're going from about 80% survival in our controls down to around 12% survival in the most severe knockdowns. So, it looks like the animals don't need these genes to survive under normal conditions, but under drying conditions, they can't robustly survive desiccation without some of these genes. So, that was really exciting for us, but we wanted to go a step further and ask, if these genes and the proteins they encode might be sufficient for conferring the ability to dry out. So what we did was we took these genes from tardigrades and we put them into yeast, so a fungus, or bacteria. Um, 
And what you can see is if we put in just an empty vector, so that's like our control where we haven't really added a new gene to those systems, you have very low levels of survival. But then when we add some of our CHS genes, we get big increases in the ability of those cells to survive being dried out. And I'll just point out that the, these, uh, the y-axis in both these graphs uh, is on a log scale. So we're going up in order of magnitude each, each tick. So in both cases, in, in yeast and in bacteria, we were able to increase desiccation tolerance by two orders of magnitude. So that's like a hundred fold increase in being able to survive desiccation. So for us, this was super exciting. We were seeing in the tardigrades themselves that these genes look like they were important for survival. And then if we take these genes and put them into other organisms that normally don't have those genes, it increases their desiccation tolerance. But, you know, cells and organisms, they're, they're really complicated, right? There's a lot of stuff inside of cells. Um, and so we don't really know how these proteins might be interacting with those things. So we wanted to ask, if we just purified these tardigrade proteins and just had them like in a test tube, would that be enough to protect biological material from desiccation? And so that's what we tried. Um, so to do that, we basically came up with this assay where we're looking at the activity of this enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH for short. Now it doesn't really matter what this enzyme is um, for you guys, but basically we chose this enzyme because it's cheap. You can just buy it from a company and it's really easy to measure its activity. So in the lab, you can tell if the enzyme's working or not. So what we do is we take this enzyme, we measure its activity. Then we put it in a speed vac, which is just like a machine that dries stuff out really efficiently. And we, we dried it out overnight. We rehydrate it, and then we basically measure its activity again to see if that desiccation and rehydration cycle broke the enzyme. And what this little black dot is representing is the activity of that enzyme after being desiccated and rehydrated. And what you can see is its percent activity is essentially nil. So it works at less than 1% its original activity. So desiccation <coughs> destroys this enzyme, all right? So then we wanted to ask if we could start adding protectants uh, in with this enzyme that might be able to stabilize it when we desiccate it and rehydrate it. So we started off with two control molecules, and those molecules are called trellose and uh, serum albumin. And the reason that we chose these molecules was that they're FDA-approved excipients. An excipient is just like a fancy word for something that you add to a pharmaceutical or a drug formulation that helps stabilize the, the active component of, of that formulation. So what you can see is that as we add more of our protectant, so more of the trellos or serum albumin, we start to see that we can actually recover some activity of our enzyme. So we can protect it to some degree. And if we add enough of these protectants, we actually get up to 100% activity back. So we can completely protect this enzyme from desiccation using these two protectants. All right. So that was great, but um, we wanted to see what our tardigrade proteins could do compared to these FDA-approved uh, protectants. So when we started adding these in, we got really excited because not only could we reach 100% protection with our tardigrade proteins, but we were doing so about an order of magnitude more efficiently than with the FDA approved protectants. So you need much less of the tardigrade protein to achieve the same level of protection. Uh, so that was really exciting. And essentially it led us to ask the question of what, what is so special about these CHS proteins? Like why are they so good at protecting things from desiccation. So we fumbled around for a while in the lab trying to answer that question, uh, and then eventually came back to this fact that these CHS proteins, they do something pretty strange for proteins, and that is they form gels. So most proteins, basically when you get them at high concentration, 
they tend to sort of start sticking together and forming like clumpy aggregates that will just like fall out of solution. Pardon? I'll flip the lights. Oh yeah, great. So as opposed to forming these sort of clumpy aggregates, uh, these proteins actually form gel. So they like they basically turn into jello. And what what we're showing here on the left uh, is an assay that an undergrad in the lab Akash came up with that he calls the flip test. Uh, and this was just like a quick easy assay that he came up with to see if, if proteins he was working with would form gels or not. So what he does is he takes bacteria that have basically been engineered to express our proteins. Um, he grows up those bacteria and he puts them in these little glass test tubes. Then he adds this dye called kumasi, which is this blue dye, and he adds it just so when we take a picture you can basically see the proteins. Um, he then takes that solution and he sonicates it, which basically bursts open the bacterial cells, and that causes everything inside the cells to like spill out into the bottom of these tubes, including all of our protein that we engineered them to make. <coughs> then he flips the tubes over and basically sees, do those proteins make gels or not? And if they do make gels, they'll get stuck in the bottom of the tube and not leak out. Um, so that's what these first five tubes are showing. Those are all um, different bacterial strains expressing different CHS proteins from tardigrades. And this last tube here is uh, a bacterial strain expressing this, this protein called alpha-synuclein, which is it's just a control protein that we used. It's another disordered protein, but it's one that has no connection with desiccation tolerance. And what you can see is that that solution did not gel and just basically ran out the bottom of the tube. Um, we can also look at these gels under an electron microscope. So that's what you're looking at over here on the right side. So we looked at some control proteins. So lysozyme is a very well studied globular protein. So it's not disordered. It has a well ordered structure. If you denature that protein or unfold it, it doesn't work well anymore. And what you can see is when you get lysozyme at high concentration, it just sort of starts forming these like clumps, basically. Now, if you look at gelatin under a, an electron microscope, so gelatin is the protein component of jello, so it forms a gel. What you can see is instead of forming these like clumps or aggregates, it forms these kind of web like networks. And that's really characteristic of a gel. So you have these kind of fibers and pores that make up the gel. And with our CHS proteins here on the right, what well you can see, this is just showing two different magnifications. They also form these reticular or web-like networks that are characteristic of gels. Um, now this next slide uh, looks complicated, but this is basically um, just a technique, uh, a physical chemistry technique called cone plate rheometry. None of that matters. What, what matters here is basically when you, when you use cone plate rheometry, you can use that to measure when a material has become a gel or if it is a gel. <coughs> and so the blue line is basically showing uh, the elastic component, like how elastic a material is. And the red line is showing how viscous uh, a material is. And when a material becomes more elastic than viscous, in material science, we consider that a gel. So whenever this blue line like outstrips or becomes greater than the red line, we have a gel. And the whole point of this is basically to show that the more of this, these tardigrade proteins that you have together, the greater their concentration, the faster the gel will form and the stronger the gel will be. So there's a concentration dependence for these gels forming. If you have very few of these proteins, like in a dilute solution, they won't form a gel very quickly. If you have a lot of them, they'll form a gel really fast, and that gel will be really strong. And so you can sort of see that with this lower concentration, like around seven grams, it takes a long time for the gel to form, and it's pretty weak. So the, the y-axis is basically measuring how strong the gel is. But you can see up at like 60 grams per liter, we can't even get it on the machine fast enough. It's already, become, it's already gelled before we can even get it on the machine. So the concentration dependence to, to gelation. Now, like I said, 
the ability of proteins to form gels is kind of an odd thing. So we were curious if the gelling properties of these proteins might play some role in their ability to protect uh, other, other proteins or enzymes during desiccation. And so one thing that happens during desiccation to desiccation sensitive proteins is that as water is lost, a lot of proteins have hydrophobic cores. So they have hydro hydrophobic residues that basically want to get away from water. So that's like a major driving force for a lot of protein folding is the protein kind of folds up and tries to like hide all those hydrophobic cores inside of the protein. So as water is lost, there's not this huge drive to hide those hydrophobic residues. So the protein can start to denature. And when it begins to denature, those hydrophobic residues are exposed and they'll, if they encounter other hydrophobic residues, they'll interact and then you can get these, these aggregates forming. So we were curious if this gel state that, that our tardigrade proteins adopt might be able to help stabilize proteins in their proper folded conformation before they are able to denature and, and aggregate together. And to do that, uh, we basically came up with this assay where we can look directly at the folded state of this protein called SH3. And so SH3 is a really interesting protein because it's what we call a metastable protein. And what that means is that in solution, it can exist as a folded, in a folded state or in an unfolded state. And it can sort of go back and forth between those two states in solution. So if we label this protein uh, in, a, in a special way that allows us to use NMR, um, we can essentially measure the folded species and the unfolded species. So that's what we did. We looked at SH3 just by itself using NMR. And as one would expect, you have some of the protein that's folded and some of the protein that's unfolded. Then what we did was we spiked in, so we added in some of our tardigrade proteins uh, at a sufficient concentration to form a gel. And what we see is that that unfolded species of protein disappeared and there was a corresponding increase in the folded species. So the unfolded protein either got pushed into a folded state or the folded protein, once it folded up, basically got locked in that state or potentially both. So we really were interested in how these gels might form, like what about these proteins allow them to form gels. And as I said before, um, these proteins are intrinsically disordered, so we can't crystallize them and sort of get uh, sort of structural information that might give us hints and clues that way. But we can do some computational modeling to try and look at what types of shapes these proteins might adopt. So. This is a, a molecular dynamic simulation that a collaborator of mine made. And this might just look like a bunch of like squiggly shapes, but if you actually start to analyze what shapes this, these proteins are, uh, are predicted to adopt, basically the takeaway from that analysis is that these proteins basically, they look like dumbbells or barbells, where they have these two collapsed terminal regions, and those regions are held apart from each other by this extended linker. Now, in solution, the protein is constantly in flux, right? But by and large, it adopts a structure that looks kind of like this, this dumbbell-like shape. Now, that got us really excited when we saw that, because if you overlay some other bio, bioinformatic predictions, you really quickly come up with a prediction of how these proteins might be polymerizing to form a gel. So when we, did, when we did these bioinformatic predictions, we were basically looking at what regions within the protein might, uh, might mediate protein-protein interaction or protein binding. And what we found was, so these blue regions highlighted here are binding regions. By and large, they fall into these collapsed terminal regions. And so what we think is probably going on is that you can get inter-protein interaction where other proteins can interact with each other, but you're not getting intra-protein interaction 
where the two <laughs> like sort of sticky ends of a single protein come together and interact because you have this extended linker that's holding them apart. So in dilute solution, when you don't have a lot of these proteins around, we think that essentially you have these sort of sticky, sticky ends that are able to mediate protein-protein um, interaction. And like I said, yeah, they're held apart by this linker. So an individual molecule, those sticky ends aren't gonna come together and interact. But if you have a bunch of proteins, those sticky ends can kind of reach out and interact with their neighbor. And in that way, you could start building up this sort of web-like gel network. So we can test that hypothesis. And to do that, we essentially broke down our protein into to three different regions. We had the N-terminal sticky region, highlighted in red. We had the extended linker that's highlighted in pink here. And then the C-terminal sticky region uh, highlighted in pink in blue. So the wild type protein has an N-terminal region, a linker, and a C-terminal region. And we know that that forms a gel, right? We saw that before. So it forms a nice uh, web-like network, uh, characteristic of a gel. If we express any sort of, of these like chopped up parts of the protein, so if we just express the N-terminus with the linker, the linker with the C-terminus, just the N-terminal region by itself, just the linker by itself, or just the C-terminal region by itself, those parts of the protein by themselves cannot form a gel. So we didn't get any gels forming. We can swap uh, the regions back and forth. So we can replace the N-terminal sticky region with a C-terminal region, or vice versa, replace the C-terminal with the N-terminal region. And those will form gels. So it seems like as long as we keep that dumbbell-like structure intact, we get these, these uh, web-like networks forming. And then we can also play with the length of the linker. Um, and as long as we keep that linker long enough that those two collapsed terminal regions can't come together and interact, we still get gels forming. But if we make, it, if we make that linker too short, instead of getting these nice web-like networks, we start getting much clumpier uh, sort of solids forming. So why is all this important? So beyond this sort of stabilizing potential that we saw the gel had on protein folding, one thing that was really intriguing about seeing a gel forming was the fact that gels are basically amorphous solids. So like those, those sort of web-like networks that I was showing, they didn't really seem to have a uh, really well-defined structure, right? They looked a little random. Um, now, the consequence of that, what we predicted was, when those gels dried out, instead of forming crystals, which have really well-defined molecular structures, they would form what we call vitrified or glass-like solids. Now, why that's important, there t there's two main reasons. The first is, that crystals are really bad things to have inside of cells. So crystals are sharp and pointy, and if you have a bunch of crystals inside of cells, they can puncture membranes or you know, damage proteins, shred up DNA. Whereas a vitrified solid or glass-like solid has a much more amorphous molecular structure. It's much less regimented in, in its molecular structure. And so, not only is it much more gentle than a crystal, but it's actually able to sort of form around molecules. And it, the, the hypothesis is that it would make the, the inside of a cell, the cytoplasm, so viscous that all the processes going on inside of a cell, like proteins unfolding as they're drying or membranes fusing, would be slowed down to such a degree that essentially on a biological time scale, they just wouldn't really happen. Um, so you're basically slowing down all the damage that's being incurred. Um, and we wanted to essentially look and see if we could measure or detect the presence of vitrified solids versus crystalline solids. And to do that, we can use a technique called differential scanning calorimetry. And basically, 
using this technique, you heat up your sample to you know, a certain point. And, and at a certain point, different materials will go through different phase transitions. So if you have a vitrified solid, it'll go through what's called a glass transition. That's where a glass-like solid is actually breaking down and becoming more like a rubbery solid. And with differential scanning calorimetry, uh, you produce these thermograms. And this sort of step-like thermogram is very characteristic of a glass breaking down. So if you see kind of a, a thermogram that takes a step like that, it probably means that there was some sort of glass-like material there that broke down. So in this first, uh, first uh, thermogram, what we're showing is we're showing two different populations of tardigrades that we stuck in a DSC. The first were what we call preconditioned animals. So these are animals that when we dried them out, we dried them out slowly, so they had time to accumulate these protectants. And what you can see is they have this nice step-like thermogram indicating that they have some material inside of them that vitrified. It turned into a, so a, a glass-like solid as opposed to a crystalline solid. The blue line here is a thermogram for non-conditioned animals. So those are animals that we dried out really fast, so they didn't have time to accumulate protectants. And what you can see is they don't have this glass-like material. So the tardigrades, when they're drying out, they're making some material, a lot of some material, that's going to allow them to, to form a glass instead of a crystal. Yeah? Is there a time frame associated with your definition of quickly, or is it just the percent humidity? Yeah, so when we dry the animals out, um, we, to precondition them, we initially start them out drying for 16 hours at 95% relative humidity. And after that, they've sort of been like exposed to the fact that they are going to dry out. After that, you can dry them out really quickly. So after that, we take them out, we just put them in a desiccating chamber and they dry out really quickly. And we leave them in there for 24 hours. Um, but they probably dry out in like an hour or so after we, we switch them. So that first, 16 hours, like overnight, sort of precondition, makes basically allows them to get protectants, accumulate protectants that make them sufficient to survive subsequent drying. So then, if we take purified CHS proteins, so these this is just the protein in a test tube now, um, and we dry those out and look at them by differential scanning calorimetry, we see that. Those, those proteins also have a glass transition. And probably most compelling, if we put those, if we put our tardigrade proteins into yeast that normally do not have them, we see a novel glass forming. So these top three lines here, these top three thermograms here, are yeasts that are not expressing our proteins. And you can see they, they don't have a, a strong glass transition here. But when we, when we put in our tardigrade proteins, you see a novel glass transition forming. So the question then is like, who really cares? Like tardigrades are making this glassy stuff when they dry out, but is it actually helping to protect them? So luckily we can begin to try and test that by heating dried animals up to their glass transition temperature and seeing at the temperature at which that material that's vitrified starts to break down and become more rubbery, do they lose their ability to survive in a dry state? So just as a control, in blue here, we have uh, animals that were hydrated. So they never had a chance to make these vitrified solids. Um, and if we heat them up, they die quite quickly, right? So we don't see any survivors after around like heating to about 38 degrees. Um, there's no, no animals that survive. But if we dry them out, so we desiccate them in black here, you can see they survive heating quite well up to their glass transition temperature, which is highlighted by this gray <laughs> bar here. As we approach the glass transition temperature, we start to see a decrease in survival. And once you heat the animals past the point where the glassiness 
of that material has broken down, we don't see any survivors. And we see the same thing in yeast expressing our tardigrade proteins, where they survive quite well up to the glass transition temperature, shown in gray here by this bar. Then as they're going through that glass transition, their survival decreases quite a bit, quite dramatically. And then beyond the glass transition temperature point, where all that glassy material is now a rubbery material, we don't see any of those animals surviving in a dry state. So that's correlative, but it starts to give us some clues at least that being in a vitrified state is important for these animals and, and engineered cells surviving desiccation. So to kind of summarize what we think is happening in normal cells, um, you have desiccation sensitive proteins. As water is lost, they begin to denature. That exposes their hydrophobic cores, which ultimately can lead to non-functional aggregates forming. In tardigrade cells, you also have desiccation-sensitive proteins, but in addition, you have these dumbbell-like CHS proteins. Now, as water is lost, not only uh, you know, is the solvent leaving, so those tardigrade proteins become more concentrated, but the animals actually upregulate expression of the genes. So they just make a lot of these tardigrade proteins. And at some critical concentration, those tardigrade uh, CHS proteins start to polymerize and they form these gel-like networks. Now inside the pores of these gels, you have the desiccation sensitive proteins, they get trapped in there. And we think that that actually helps keep them from unfolding. And then upon complete desiccation, instead of forming crystals, which would crush all those sensitive proteins that are sort of trapped in the pores, the tardigrade intrinsically disordered proteins form glasses, which have a much more amorphous structure that are able to more gently encapsulate um, these proteins and prevent them from, from unfolding and, and aggregating further. And then what I think is probably the most sort of amazing part of, of this uh, whole sort of cycle, which we haven't really started studying yet, is that when you add water back to the system, those tardigrade proteins, they resolvate, so they go back into solution really fast. And so you have all these sensitive proteins that were protected inside that matrix getting released back into the cytosol of the cells where they can perform their proper function. Um, so what I told you today, I told you about these proteins called CHS proteins and showed you some evidence that the animals, the tardigrades themselves, need those proteins to survive drying out. I showed you that at high concentration, those proteins form gels, and those gels seem to be able to stabilize other proteins in a folded conformation. And then when those gels dry out, Instead of forming crystals, they form more amorphous or glass-like solids. And the glassiness of that material seems to correlate with their protective capabilities. And uh, these, are, these are folks in my lab now, and some folks that I worked with at UNC that I'd really like to thank uh, for, for helping with these experiments. And then we had a whole bunch of collaborators that we worked with on this project and, and other projects. Um, and if anybody has any questions, <coughs> I'd be happy to try and answer them. Yeah? Um, so for the specific um, tardigrades that you talked about that survived up to like 100 yeah. degrees Celsius, yeah. do you see that their specific like, um, glass transition temperatures are higher than the ones you said? Exactly. Yeah, so we've looked at the glass transition temperature of different species of tardigrades, and different species have different glass transition temperatures, and they, they'll survive desiccation up to those points. And one thing that I didn't point out, but maybe, maybe some of you all noticed this, was if we actually look at the temperature at which the glass transitions are occurring in the, tar in the tardigrades we're studying here, it's at around 98 degrees, but then purified, they go through a transition around 55 degrees, and in yeast, it's around 70 degrees. So we think that the environment in which these proteins are polymerizing in actually like influences the properties of those glasses that are forming. So we've done an experiment now 
where we looked at the metabolites, so all kind of like the small molecules and co-solutes that tardigrades make a lot of when they dry out. And we're actually in vitro, so like in a test tube, taking our tardigrade proteins and those small molecules and mixing them together to see how those small molecules influence the properties of, of the glasses that form. Yeah? Yeah, that's a great question. So it kind of depends on w how you look for other CHS proteins. So if you just take the sequence of the proteins and you compare it to the sequence of other proteins that we know of, we don't see any matches. So at the level of sequence conservation, these proteins seem like they're unique to tardigrades. However, at the level of biochemical and biophysical properties, they look like some other proteins in other organisms. So remember I mentioned that these CHS proteins are what we call intrinsically disordered proteins. They don't really have a well-characterized or, or well-defined structure. They can kind of change shape. Um, so you actually you find a lot of intrinsically disordered proteins in other systems, in other organisms that can survive being dried out. And so probably the most famous example is in plant seeds. So plant seeds have, uh, well, several families of, of proteins that are called late embryogenesis abundant or LIA proteins. So these are proteins that are made at really high levels just as seeds are becoming desiccation tolerant. So, you know, you can dry seeds out, right? When you buy seeds, they're like in a little envelope, um, dry. And it's been thought for a long time that the accumulation of these LIA proteins in seeds is correlated with the seed's ability to survive desiccation. Um, so actually in almost every desiccation tolerant system that people have looked, they found high levels of, the, of disordered proteins. But, you know, so they seem to share the, the property of being disordered, of not having a well-defined <clears throat> structure. But at the actual level of sequence conservation, they look unique, implying that it may be a case of convergent evolution where different systems have basically evolved the same type of molecule um, but through independent evolutionary routes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in our lab, we haven't done these experiments, but other, other folks have uh, looked at different metabolic processes in the dried animals. And essentially, they look like there is no, meta it looks like there is no metabolism going on, um, which makes sense because you need an aqueous environment, like you need water for metabolism to occur. Um, so yeah, essentially, I, I think in that ton state, the animals basically curl up in a little ball, which the insides of their cells essentially just turn into glass, which locks you know, all the molecules and stuff in place. And there's basically nothing going on in there until you add water back to the system and then everything kind of dissolves and restarts. Yeah. Um, so you were saying for drying out, <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the short answer is no. Um, so for radiation, for example, you can just expose them to a really high dose of radiation and they're fine. Um, for freezing, uh, you know, I guess to some degree you do need to freeze them slowly. Like if you just drop them directly into liquid nitrogen, they won't survive. But you know you can take a tube of them and throw it in the minus 80 freezer, and in the hour or whatever it takes them to freeze, they'll survive that. Um, so it kind of yeah it kind of depends on the on the stress, and we actually I don't, I don't know if you remember this graph that I was showing at the beginning of my talk, but we're, it was showing basically different rates at which tardigrades can survive drying out different species.
And so one of those species that we showed survived desiccation um, much, more, much more robustly than others. So Milnesium tardigratum can survive, shown in black here, can survive desiccation at much higher rates. And when we did transcriptome sequencing on that species, what we found was actually it expresses these CHS genes at really high levels all the time. So like they weren't really increased that much when we started to dry the animals out because they already expressed them at really high levels. And we think that might be why they're able to survive quicker drying because they basically already have a lot of protectants that, they, that they'll need that are kind of pre-made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so since they see the sequence of the CSH gene is unique, how are we able to find a particular inter RNA inter interference for that gene, or is it just a general interference? Yeah, so with, with RNA interference, what you do is essentially you make double-stranded RNA, so you can synthesize double-stranded RNA in the lab that basically matches the sequence of the transcript that's going to come from the gene. <clears throat> so from our transcriptomic sequencing, we had the sequence of the CHS gene transcripts. So, uh, I mean, I won't go into the details of how you make the double-stranded RNA, but essentially you can make the double-stranded RNA that matches that sequence and then when you put that double-stranded RNA into cells, usually cells, uh, they'll sort of see that as foreign RNA, something that shouldn't be there, right? We don't have, there's no, tardigrades don't have a lot of double-stranded RNA floating around inside their cells. So they have endogenous machinery that will basically take that double-stranded RNA and process it, basically chop it up, and then use that as a template to go out and look in the rest of the cell and say like, is there any other foreign looking DNA here that, that looks like this double-stranded RNA? And if so, then there's other machinery that will chew that up. So in that way, you can add in specific double-stranded RNAs that will go and target and chew up a transcript that you want to get rid of. Did that, um, did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Time for one more question. <coughs> Yeah, so intrinsically disordered proteins are actually quite ubiquitous. Like, so essentially any living thing that you look at, they're intrinsically disordered proteins. Um, so yeah, so we have a lot of intrinsically disordered proteins. And in humans, um, there's been, uh, you know, quite a number of studies that have been done now. They play many roles in, you know, just basic cellular functions um, and have been linked to a lot of neurological diseases. So they sort of start to aggregate um, and form these, these aggregates and neurons and stuff that can lead to disease. So one thing that I'm really interested in is normally, so like in us, right, intrinsically disordered proteins in, in our, our neurons can start to aggregate and form these non-functional aggregates. In tardigrades, they polymerize, right, into these gels, but then very rapidly dissociate from each other. So I'm sort of interested in looking at what the difference is between our intrinsically disordered proteins that aggregate and don't come apart are, and, the, and how these tardigrade proteins are able to come together, but then dissociate from one another. All right. Well, Thank thanks you for thanks very much. Talk. Let's thank you.